Okay, I think uh, we can start now. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second day of the RBC Design Conference on Deployable AI. And uh, today we have uh, an interesting and exciting cast of uh, speakers uh, lined up, and I hope it will be a, a great uh, session for all of you. And uh, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's loud and clear. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, so as a first talk, uh, we have a uh, talk by Professor uh, Vineet uh, Balasubramaniam on explaining neural networks using a causal perspective. Uh, professor Vineet Balasubramaniam is uh, an associate professor at uh, the Department of CSE at IIT Hyderabad, and he currently is the HOD of uh, the Artificial Intelligence Department at IITH. So his uh, research interests include deep learning, machine learning, and computer vision, and uh, his research has resulted in several uh, top uh, Conference, conference and journal publications. And uh, he, he did his PhD in Arizona State on conformal predictions framework. And he has uh, had several uh, other achievements. Uh, his research is funded by several organizations, including DST, MIT, and all that. And uh, we are extremely have, glad to have uh, Professor Vinit present this, uh, this work on explaining neural networks and using a causal perspective. And with that, I'll hand over to Professor Vinit. Thank you very much, Harish, for the very kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi, and all the organizers for uh, the invite to share our research uh, in this event. I think it seems like a very nice event, and hopefully, I'll be able to attend uh, other talks too. Just please give me one moment. I'll just go full screen and uh, just see. Okay, uh, I hope my screen is more visible now. Uh, it's full screen. Okay. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So, just a quick time check before I start. So, this is a half an hour talk with uh, QA afterwards, right? Am I correct or uh, is it half an hour with QA? Half an hour plus QA. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, my uh, talk today is going to be uh, keeping in with the theme of this, um, this event is explaining neural networks, but a causal twist uh, to how, how we can explain neural networks in general. So uh, just to a quick precursor, I know that probably everybody is talking about explainable AI, but I won't take too much time on this. But if you just sat back and uh, analyzed where machine learning is used everywhere around us, right? Take it from, say, your uh, Google Translate or your Facebook face uh, detection or your Amazon product recommendation system, it's everywhere around us. And if you have to abstract out what questions were they answering in these kinds of different products and services, the typical question would be, what is the product relevant to the user? What is the sentiment of the street? What are the objects in the image? And the abstraction is, what is X? Right? If you also thought a little deeper, a lot of these applications, maybe a significant number of them, the cost of a bad decision is actually low. Right? a bad product recommendation or a bad movie recommendation, you probably lose five, 500 rupees, 1000 rupees, and maybe a few, a little bit of time, but the cost is not the loss of a life or an arm or a leg. Right? So that's an important thing to observe with the successes of machine learning around us. And in most of these applications, accuracy is considered all important. So I think a lot of efforts around the world today is about beating that number that somebody else has got and getting one percentage point higher or two percentage points higher than others. And the, often the why doesn't matter in these kinds of, um, in these kinds of efforts. It, this leads to a very one dimensional way of measuring the performance of machine learning models in general. So the obvious question then is what do we really want? Uh, so what do we really want is where machine learning is yet to fulfill its promise. In some sense, you could say these are complex real world systems risk sensitive systems such as say medical diagnosis, financial modeling and prediction, safety critical systems like say cockpit decision support, so on and so forth. And in these kinds of applications, the cost of a bad decision can be very, very high, right? Obviously there could be fatalities, lives in, uh, in many of these cases. Not that machine learning is not used in these applications, it's probably used in subsystems, but not for the final decision making. Okay, that's what I'm trying to point out here. And in these kinds of applications, accuracy perhaps is not the only objective and one needs a multidimensional perspective to be able to analyze the performance of systems in such kinds of applications. So uh, today it's understood that for most of existing machine learning models, including deep learning models, there's a trade-off 
between accuracy and interpretability. On one hand, you have linear regression decision trees, which are most interpretable, but their accuracy does not uh, is not really good on real world complex kinds of data. On the other hand, you have neural networks on the other side, which are very which are far more accurate than these models, but then they're very black box in terms of their explainability. So what are we looking for? We are looking for pushing the frontier towards the top right. right? So we ideally want accurate models that are also interpretable. That's what we are ideally uh, looking for. So with that brief introduction, I'll briefly just talk about the different things that we have been doing in our group here at IIT Hyderabad, and then I'll focus on one of them for, for the rest of this talk. So we have been looking at uh, trying to look at causal perspectives to explainable neural networks. I'll focus on one such effort today and probably end with a few directions that we have been exploring. We've also been looking at visual explanations. So when you use convolutional neural networks for uh, image classification, where was the model looking at while making a prediction? We've also been looking at how do you generate rationales for predictions, so human understandable rationales. So if uh, you make a prediction and say an image is a cat, can you actually generate a human understandable rationale to say that the cat has say four legs and whiskers and a tail and fur, so on and so forth, how do you do that? And more recently, we've also been looking at the connect between explainability and adversarial robustness. I mean, this effort is perhaps motivated by one simple example. So uh, you may have heard of ad adversarial perturbations and adversarial attacks, where if you take an image of a cat and perturb one or two pixels, then the model starts thinking it's an ostrich. It initially predicted it's a cat, but then with perturbations to a few pixels, it becomes an ostrich. Right? Uh, so if the model could give us same explanations for both of these predictions, it's likely that it will not make this mistake. Right? There's no sane way a model could change an image of a cat by three pixels, call it an ostrich, and be able to explain it in a semantic way. Right? So that's what that's the connect that we have been exploring in the, in the connections between explainability and adversarial robustness. So one of our earliest efforts in this space, which is uh, reasonably well used today, is called GradCam++, which was published about three years ago, but since then has been used for several uh, applications, including uh, finding defective cells in solar arrays, cancer prediction on gene expression data, many more, and more recently even on uh, explaining COVID in chest X-ray images in many, in many efforts uh, around the world. But the work that I'm going to focus on today is one such effort called causal attributions in uh, neural networks, which is about trying to uh, find out what causal relationships did a neural network learn when it learned the model. So we all are probably aware that when a neural network learns a model and makes predictions, it learns relationships between data. But these relationships could be correlational, which is more likely, or causal. So how do you isolate these two and be able to say what causal attributions a neural network has learned is the focus of this work. To the best of our knowledge, this was one of the first causal efforts for attribution in neural networks uh, at that time. This was joint work with students, Aditya, Piyushi, and Anirban. So what is attributions of neural network? Attribution is can be defined as effect of an input feature on the prediction function's output, right? So if you have, say, uh, healthcare data, you want to see what is the effect of, say, blood pressure on the risk of a heart attack on a particular patient, right? Assuming we had uh, patient profile attributes that included blood pressure. This, if you act, look at the definition, it's inherently a causal question. We want to know what causal impact an input feature had on a prediction function's output. However, most of the methods that are used today are gradient-based methods where you take a trained model and then analyze different kinds of gradients of the model just the gradient with respect to a particular layer. And then there are many variants like smooth grad, integrated gradient, and varieties of them that all of them look at different combinations of gradient to be able to study attribution. And But in this particular case, the question that's asked is, how much would perturbing a particular input affect the output? This is not necessarily a causal analysis, as I'll probably try to explain over the next few slides. The other popular approach to use uh, to, for explainability is use surrogate models, use some other machine learning model on top of a model and be able to explain. This again could result out of correlations in both these models. So both of them don't answer the causal question while explaining uh, the neural network model. So the focus of this work was uh, what are the causal attributions learned by a trained neural network model? And uh, we assume one setting here, which is generally valid which is that input dimensions are causally independent of each other. Maybe I'll talk towards the end if any of you are interested on how do you address the situation if this is not so. 
but they can be jointly caused by a latent confounder. That doesn't matter to us. As long as the input dimension is causally independent of each other, it should be fine. So if you've done PCA on your data and uh, you've removed those correlations, you probably that kind of a data may actually satisfy the setting that we're actually exploring. So we show how this method can be done with both uh, feedforward networks as well as recurrent neural networks, which can get a bit tricky because of their uh, uh, because of the relationships between the outputs and the inputs. So the premise of uh, causal inference is to assume what is called a structural causal model, which shows the relationships between variables as well as the functions that relate how variables generate data belonging to another variable. Right? So you have a tuple which consists of endogenous variables x, exogenous variables u, causal functions f, and a distribution over, over u. This is the general definition that people use. And what we start with is to show that you could interpret even a neural network as a structural causal model. So one thing I want to state here is that uh, the data as such is generated by a structural causal model. Right? So the data that we see around us is generated through some principles of causal influence. Unfortunately, we don't have access to that. Right? So in this work, we're focusing on the structural causal model the neural network has learned while training the model. So we view the neural network as a structural causal model where if uh, these neurons here, A, B, C, D, E, F, are your input neurons, JKL are your output neurons, and U1, U2, U3, U4 could be your unobserved confounders. So you don't know them, but they are some variables that cause the inputs. Right? So that's the way you want to see this. And if you marginalize out your hidden layers here, which can be done, you can reduce your structural causal model to only a relationship between your input variables and your output variables. So we denote this structural causal model as M prime, where you have L1, which is your input layer, Ln, which is our output layer, and then the rest of it is the same as the definition for a structural causal model. And F prime is here. F prime is not a gradient, sorry for that notation, but F prime are the causal functions that show how JKL was caused by ABCDEF. That's what F prime here denotes. That's what completes the definition of a structural causal model. You could similarly do a similar reduction process for uh, a recurrent neural network, where uh, you have a recurrent neural network, your input neurons are below, your output, uh, output layer or neurons are above, and you have your hidden layers in between, be it an LSTM or just a layer, all of them are in between. You could once again marginalize over those layers and get a structural causal model that relates the input and the output. The key difference here uh, from the MLP scenario is there could be a, a connection from the output at a previous time step to the input at the next time step. So that is something that is different in an RNN than a simple MLP when you look at the structural causal model. So if you looked at existing methods that capture gradient-based attribution, you could view them as measuring what is called individual causal effect. Right? So uh, individual causal effect in causality is measured as ICE, individual causal effect, is when you intervene on an attribute XI and set it to alpha, which means you're going to take one of your attributes and fix it to a value. You won't let it change. Anything else can change, but that cannot change. So you set your BP to 100, 200 by 120, and then you want to see now what's the causal effect of a certain variable on, uh, say, the output that you're trying to measure, say, the risk of heart attack. So that's given here by Y, which is the output at Xi is equal to alpha of input U minus Y of U in some other general scenario. Maybe when your BP was normal, 120 by 80, say, okay. So when you set alpha to Ui plus epsilon, it becomes a gradient-based attribution method, right? Because you're perturbing that input Ui by a small value epsilon, and you're trying to see what is the causal effect by changing it. So in some sense, gradient-based methods are measuring a quantity called the individual causal effect, but gradient-based methods are sensitive and they cannot, they may not be able to give global attributions. That leads us to, uh, to defining a quantity called the average causal effect, which is commonly used in uh, causal literature, which is given as expectation of Y given for binary variables, it would be given as expectation of over Y of Y, given that you intervene and set an attribute to one, minus the expectation of the output variable, given that you intervene and set the attribute to zero. So which means if you take an attribute, set it to zero, set it to one, see the output difference, take an expectation over a lot of data, and that gives you the average causal effect of that variable on the output. Continuous variables become a little bit more challenging, uh, where the average causal effect is defined as 
expectation of y given you intervene and set xi is equal to alpha minus some baseline over xi right so you must have some baseline as i said if you are measuring the causal effect of blood pressure on an output you you know your baseline value right you know what it should be and you can measure this on the right but in all applications you may not have such a baseline so the way we go about doing it is to simply say we're going to take an expectation over xi of this first term here so you compute the expectation over y and then compute that over all possible values of xi and that's what we define as the baseline in this work of course you could replace this baseline with any other baseline if you knew it for a particular domain <clears throat> so the first term here in the average causal effect is what is called as an interventional expectation because you're intervening and then computing the expectation which is difficult to do because you have to now allow all other variables to vary over all possible values and measure the values of y that becomes difficult to compute so in fact this is how the interventional expectation is formally defined and that's something that becomes non trivial to compute so to be able to compute that we begin with a few definitions so why we define is the output of the neural network remember f prime is not a gradient it's just the causal function of the input variables mu j is the mean of each of your input attributes so mu j is the interventional mean of xj given that you intervene on xi and set it to alpha mu is a vector composed of all the mu j's so that's how we define these quantities given these quantities we compute a taylor series expansion which is uh, f again prime is just a function not a gradient of l1 which is your input layer uh, we take a taylor series expansion around mu so you have the standard second order taylor series expansion if you now take an expectation over this taylor series expansion the second term would go away because the expectation over l1 will become mu mu is the uh, mean the way we uh, we took it so the second term would go away uh, and then you will be left with this particular uh, expression here after taking an expectation over the taylor series expansion this is what we have here so this is what we ideally have to compute to get that interventional expectation in that first quantity of the average causal effect so now what we use is the assumption that we had in the beginning that each of the inputs are causally independent of each other which means each intervene input neuron is deseparated from other input neurons which means probability of xj given do of xi is equal to alpha is probability of xj itself right because they are deseparated okay, so you not this distribution is the observational distribution and the interventional distribution are going to remain the same in this particular context so what does that mean that gives us something interesting because it now tells us that the interventional means and covariances of the non intervened neurons are the same as observational means and covariances which can be pre computed even 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 before you're training your model you have your data with you you can compute all of these observational means and variances for each of these variables and keep it with you right once you do that offline you can straight away plug those values in in this formulation and for the neuron that you intervene on when i say neuron i mean one of those input neurons remember what we are trying to do is intervene on each of your input features or input neurons and we are trying to see what's the effect on the output okay what's the causal effect on the output is what we are trying to study so for the intervene neuron itself expectation of i given do of xi is equal to alpha will be alpha covariance of xi xj given do xi of alpha is will be equal to zero because remember they are independent so this allows us to compute the average causal effect which is given by the interventional expectation minus the baseline the baseline if you knew it from some domain knowledge you can plug it in here or we simply use the the expectation over these interventional expectations and uh, to be able to compute some of these values we also use something called causal regressors which allows us to plug in a few different alpha values we learn some bayesian we learn uh, we use bayesian regression to learn some regressors there and we plug that in to be able to predict the causal effect for other interventions for other values of interventions okay, that's the way we go about computing all of this uh, then if this was the case for multi mlps how do you do it for rnns uh, i think we all know that rnns can be uh, rnns can have different kinds of architectures so if you had an rnn architecture where you did not have an output at each time step you had an output only in the last time step you can exactly do what we did right everything what we did so far can be directly used because no output feeds into any input will be perfectly fine however if you 
have an output at each time step, then some of these computational simplifications cannot be done. And you actually have to do the interventional expectation completely. I mean, it would be a computationally intensive problem, but that's the only way to handle that kind of a scenario. One last question here is uh, in the computation of our average causal effect, you would notice that there is actually a Hessian term, right? So because there was a second order Taylor series expansion, there's actually a Hessian term in the second term there. How do you compute that for a deep neural network becomes a problem again, right? So we all know that his computing Hessians for a neural network is pretty tricky. So what we do is show, we show that by playing around with some linear algebra, uh, this quantity that we are looking for, instead of computing the Hessian alone, we can compute the Hessian vector product, which is typically called Hessian free computing. And we show that we can do that using three forward passes on the neural network uh, without doing much more. So that's how we simplify the computation of the average causal effect using these different uh, using these different methods. So let me show you a few results and then uh, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take questions. Is This was an initial experiment that we did on the popular IRIS data set, uh, where we uh, take each of these graphs here is one particular class, in this case, it's Iris Setosa, Iris Versicolor, and Iris Virginica. These are three different classes. For each of these classes, for each of the attributes, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, we intervene on different values and see what is the average causal effect on predicting this particular outcome for the data point. And one thing that you notice here is you see that petal length and petal width here have higher value, higher average causal effect until a certain value, especially if you see petal width, somewhere until 0.3, it has a high uh, causal effect. Then if you see uh, petal width here, it has a high causal effect on iris versicolor between 0.3 and 0.7, and it has a high causal effect between 0.7 and 1 on iris virginica. If you independently build a decision tree on the iris data set, this is one such decision tree that you get, where if you notice, the decision tree has very similar results. It says petal width less than 0.29, it's iris setosa. Petal width between 0.3 and 0.69, it's iris versicolor. And greater is iris virginica. So this seemed to agree on uh, the way the causal effect was measured using our method in this particular scenario. So another experiment that we conducted, maybe in the interest of time, I'll leave this one. This was a uh, result on RNNs, but I'll probably skip this in the interest of time and come back to it if there are any questions on this. This is a more interesting result where uh, this was an uh, experiment that was conducted jointly with uh, Honeywell Aerospace on uh, aircraft data. So this is a time series data of various aircraft parameters and trying to classify whether a landing was anomalous or non-anomalous, right? So uh, we cannot share the confidential data here, but this is a public NASA data set, which is an equivalent on the data that we were working, working with. So what you see here are four plots. The top left plot is our, uh, uh, the use of our method for computing the causal effect on an anomalous landing. The top right is our method on a normal landing. The bottom graphs are the use of integrated gradients for anomalous landing and integrated gradients for a normal landing. If you see the bottom row, integrated gradient almost makes no distinction between an anomalous landing and a normal landing. While the first thing that you see here is that there's a significant difference between the plots for an anomalous landing and a normal landing. And interestingly, the attributes that our method picks that are causal for this outcome is pitch roll and latitude longitude. Latitude longitude is more about the place where it happened, but the pitch and roll is the couple of things that the model identified as the causal reasons for the anomalous landing. And it happens that for this particular flight, the corresponding FDR report said, uh, due to slippery runway, the pilot could not apply timely brakes, resulting in a steep acceleration in the airplane post touchdown. So when we actually uh, uh, studied this with the people from Honeywell, they actually agreed with what this had predicted with the FDR report that had uh, been written for that particular flight. That's the practical use case. So one could also show that uh, uh, there are there are something called the axioms of attribution that was proposed by the integrated method, gradients method, uh, three, four years ago. They note down axioms called completeness, sensitivity, implementation invariance, linearity, and symmetry preservation in uh, in attribution methods that, uh, that attribution methods should satisfy. And it happens that gradient-based methods violate sensitivity axiom, Deep lift, LRP, other methods violate implementation invariance axiom. 
but uh, our method actually satisfies all the important axioms. Okay, there is one uh, smaller, minor deviation, but the deviation doesn't matter because for when you do a causal analysis, the completeness axiom doesn't hold, doesn't have to hold. All other axioms, uh, our method actually satisfies. So we also show how you can use this approach in a variational autoencoder to study the causal effect of latent dimensions on the output, right? In this particular case, we study the each of the latent dimensions of a VAE learned on MNIST and show that one of them is causally responsible for scale, one of them is causally responsible for the digit label, one of them is causally responsible for the rotation, so on and so forth, right? So these are things that you can do with other kinds of data sets that you learn through a VAE also. So for more details, our paper is publicly available and the code is also publicly uh, available if you'd like to take this up and try something on top of it. Maybe the last uh, two, three minutes that I have, I'll probably just talk about some recent efforts in this direction and I'll then be happy to uh, take any questions. So a few other things that we have been doing in this is, let me first talk about what you see on the right-hand side here, is so far in what I spoke about, I said you take a trained neural network model and then we try to see what causal relationships the trained neural network has learned between inputs and outputs. So, because that could help us understand what the neural network is really using to make a judgment. So now you could ask the counter question to say, if I already had some domain information, I know that uh, probably a particular attribute causes an outcome. How do I ensure that the neural network respects this while learning? Because a neural network can learn just from correlations and be able to do well on accuracy also, right? So then how do you ensure that causal relationships that you've learned is maintained in a neural network is something that we've been looking at. So we have developed this method called causal regularization. Hopefully it will be on archive sometime soon, uh, maybe in the next week or so. Uh, so where we've been looking at, uh, if you knew causal domain priors, this could be even say fairness priors. You don't, you want a particular attribute to have zero causal effect on the outcome. Maybe you want gender to have zero cause of causal effect on the outcome, right? How do you ensure that your model bakes it in during training itself? It need not be just zero causal effect. Suppose I know that my model has to have a certain monot monotonic causal effect on the outcome. How do I ensure that? It should have a U-shaped causal effect. How do you ensure that? It, it could have a J-shaped ca causal effect. How do you ensure that, right? So those are all things that we've been looking at as part of this effort on causal regularization. One of the challenges with this entire space of uh, getting a causal perspective to explainability or even explainability in general is how do you validate, right? So unfortunately, data sets today are XY tuples, but in explainable AI, we are asking for X, Y, Y hat, right? We are asking given data X, give me a prediction Y, also give me an explanation Y hat, right? So unfortunately, data sets, and what we want as output from the models don't match in this particular scenario, right? So we probably need data sets with explanations built in to be able to study all of this and be able to evaluate in an objective way. So one small effort from our direction in this space uh, has been an image data set for causal analysis in disentangled rep representations. This data set is called Candle. We hope to release it uh, sometime soon, where we have objects that are controlled by different attributes but placed in real world scenes. So we can control several things like light angle, uh, object position, scene, size, color, angle, so on and so forth. So we know how the object is rendered, but the background becomes a confounder and is, uh, is a latent confounder and can be real world scenes. So this work uh, recently won the best paper award at uh, the workshop on causality in vision at uh, CVPF 2021. So I'll probably uh, stop here. Uh, I think, yeah, I was probably right on time. I'll be happy to take questions and thank you for your patient listening. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Vineet. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, let me uh, just read that question, read those questions out. So uh, the first question on uh, Essentially, the causality of uh, I mean, the causality of the variable y, or this is the causality of the prediction of the neural network, right? Because the neural network is just a function which takes an input and gives an output. There is no causality as this for the y hat that prediction that is made. So I think the question is uh, question asked is uh, is, the, is the causality of the the true label y, or is it the 
Yeah, sure. So actually, this is what I was trying to distinguish in the beginning that there are two causal models here. One is the actual causal model that generated the data. The second thing is we are interpreting the neural network itself as a structural causal model, right? Which means you can now assume that there are causal functions that the neural network is representing between input and output. So we are studying the causal effect of the model learned by the neural network. So this need not be the original causal functions that generated the data. Unfortunately, we may not have access to that in the real world. But uh, what we're trying to do is you have a trained neural network. This is a post hoc analysis, by the way. This is not uh, anti hoc. The later part of the work that I spoke, the last slide that I had is actually an anti hoc effort. effort. So this is after taking a trained neural network model, you want to understand what causal effects between input and output that model has learned right? between every input variable and its output variable. Did I make sense? Did I? So what prevents you from just changing that particular route? For example, in the iris data set, why don't we just change that particular petal with attribute and just run it through the neural network again and uh, sure. test that instead? So that would exactly be gradient based method because that's a perturbation method where you just change XI, you make it to XI plus epsilon and see the output. So that's a typical, which exactly is an example of individual causal effect. I think the way causal uh, analysis works is if you perturb an attribute, you have to marginalize over all other attributes to know the causal effect of that variable on the output. That's the key difference between a gradient-based approach and a causal approach. And But that also becomes computationally uh, problematic because you have to marginalize over all values of all other variables. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge. Right. Arisha, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, so one question is, uh, so you're saying you're doing this post hoc analysis on the uh, train model, right? So is that, is that, is the causal model there even identifiable? I mean, can't you have potentially multiple causal models, which can, which can be got from the same network? Sure. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, generally these things are not identifiable, but once again, uh, we are not comparing this with the original data causal model. We are now assuming that the neural network, uh, again, probably this is often the confusion to be very honest. I think uh, uh, we are now looking at the neural network as a structural causal model and extracting the average causal effect. So this may not have anything to do with the actual structural causal model that was generating the data. That's almost completely separate in this particular, uh, in this particular context. And we are taking, uh, also to clarify, we are taking a trained neural network, which means everything is static now. There's nothing that's changing. The weights are not changing anymore. It's fixed. It's a trained neural network model of which we are only studying the causal effect of input on output. Did that make sense? Yes, it did. Thanks. For example, in the case where if the neural network ha actually happened, let's say, learn a linear model, just that it is hiding behind several hidden layers, then it would exactly match the gradient. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a couple of other questions. So one question asked and explaining that X, Y, Y hat of the new training data format that uh, you wish uh, we had right now. Can you explain that? Uh, sure. No, I was just uh, generally talking because I think ah, okay. the entire, uh, I mean, I feel the entire foundations of machine learning today are based on, as at least supervised learning, is based on defining data in terms of X, Y tuples, right? So that's how we define the entire formalisms in machine learning today. But then when we talk about explainable AI, we are, we are giving an input X, but now we are expecting an output Y and some meta information called explanation called Y hat. Right? So that explanation could be uh, highlighting the pixels in an image, highlighting the syllables in a document. Uh, it could be anything, right? It could be any of those. We are asking for some extra information beyond just the prediction, which is what we want to. But then it's now a mismatch, right? So the data we are feeding is XY tuples. But then the output we want when we talk about explainable machine learning is X, Y, Y hat now, right? So, uh, which which means unless we have data sets that contain this information, it's going to be very difficult to objectively evaluate. So the only way to, uh, until we have those kinds of established data sets is for subjective evaluation, right? So which already limits how much you can do. Um, I think this also leads to a philosophical discussion whether explainability can be objectively evaluated at all because how somebody sees a cat could be very, very different. Somebody could see the whiskers and call it a cat. Somebody could see fur and call it a cat. So I think it's, it also, uh, I, I think that space is very gray, very, very difficult uh, to address. I think. Uh, so this, there's a couple other questions. 
Is, okay, so I this is just a misunderstanding. I think so. Uh, this one question asked how how do you find the maximum accuracy and so on. But the training is done, right? So in your setting, the the train this is a trained model, and you are just analyzing the effect of uh, the different attributes uh, on the predict uh, that the model has on the prediction. I mean, exactly. The, the but I think that's a that's an interesting question for one dimension. Mm -hmm. So what we found is if you actually take semi-trained models. with poor accuracy our measurements start going ad hoc right our effect our measurements of uh, average causal effect don't match human intuition right so which means we can only analyze models that are doing well if the model itself is not doing well uh, trying to study its causal effect is perhaps of no use right it's not of much use at least so i think this is a deeper problem of trying to study the accuracy interpretability trade off from this perspective but yes i think we are otherwise looking at only a trained model so uh, one other uh, question in the chat panel so the vijendran has asked how the weights in the causal model compares with the classical sgd learning for example does this weight matrix have the same properties of a classical sgd uh, once again i think this is post hoc analysis right? correct yeah so uh, we assume that the neural network is already trained using sgd so its weight uh, matrices are fixed so and uh, there are no weights in this causal model so the causal model is only giving a number which is the average causal effect of an input variable on the output right it's only telling us how causal is maybe to give an example probably it's easier to give it from healthcare so if i said somebody was smoking how causal is a person smoking on say a risk of a heart attack right we want to study that and it gives a number and the number is what the neural network thinks is causal for that particular relationship right? so that's probably uh, i hope that articulation helps yeah uh, one other question that i have is uh, let's say even if your model is uh, even if your neural network model has very high accuracy on the training data it doesn't say anything about and even if it generalizes well it doesn't say anything about the structural causal model that is represented by neural network is actually used to. i mean is relevant for i mean uh, because let's say for example you take that uh, flight uh, data right right let's right. say even if you have a very well generalized model let's say which can uh, mm -hmm. uh, do very well uh, but if it has never in its training data if it has never seen uh, a situation of saying that what will happen if i change the pitch that's the kind of question that uh, you want to ask and uh, if okay i think i uh, got your uh, question so probably in some sense you're going to a counterfactual i think i mean uh, so generally these questions would be counterfactual questions where you say i think uh, so because we don't have a method here per se i i don't think the uh, idea of a counterfactual applies here but yes yeah i mean you could look at our method being able to measure the causal effect under those conditions yes you're right uh, about about that part uh, yeah yeah you can do that using this method yes yeah if you change a particular attribute uh, and uh, you can measure what will be the average causal effect for this intervention on the output that's something our method can measure okay so i think uh, that's all we have time for a couple more questions but i think we'll have to wrap oh thank you very much uh, professor vinith uh, this is a great talk thank you thank you very much thank you